the eight divisions of the Boston Municipal Court, thank you for your confidence and friendship. It has made all the difference in my life. But most especially to my family, my wife of 35 years, Michelle, and our three children, Kara, Joe, Tom, our five grandchildren, to my late mother, and my three brothers, I am blessed to be your husband, your father, your grandfather, your son, and brother. I am a son of the city of Boston. You know from my application that my father left us when I was six. We moved into my grandmother's two bedroom apartment on Lennoxdale Avenue in Dorchester. Times were tough. For a long time, we were on government assistance. The MBTA was the family car for many years and too many days and nights were spent feeling different. But we were surrounded by incredible neighbors, the Biagiotis, the Finnegans, the Lovells, all wonderful people my neighborhood family, from whom I learned that taking care of your neighbors and your neighborhood was just how life was lived. My mother had this saying whenever I worried about something, just take one day at a time. Same thing with my grandmother. Hers was, everything always works out. And I hope she's right today. They were great ladies. Nan could sew anything and made many an outfit for my mother and her other daughters. Mom could always find the best deal at Filene's basement and could stretch a buck better than anyone. I've kept their words of wisdom in my mind to this day and can't tell you how much they've guided me through my toughest times. But mom had to be mother, father, nurturer, disciplinarian, and raising four boys in Dorchester, she got pretty good at it. She taught me how to work hard, reach high, and reminded us that no matter how hard things were for us, there were plenty of people less fortunate than us, and we should be always willing and ready to help them. I attended Catholic Memorial High School and was taught by the Irish Christian Brothers. Not only were they incredible educators in teaching us to live by the motto, Vince in Bono Malum, which means conquer evil by doing good, but one or two occasionally would demonstrate how to quiet a rowdy classroom with just a perfectly aimed blackboard eraser. I graduated from Boston College in 1981, worked for then Congressman Brian Donnelly, and spent nine years working for a Quincy-based real estate contractor and developer. O'Connell Management Company. My interest in becoming a lawyer. So with a wife and two children, I worked full-time days and went to law school at night. But all was not drudgery. We had our third child in my third year. I passed the bar in 1996 and opened a practice in 1997. Over the past 24 years, I've represented between two and 3,000 people, mostly before the courts of the Boston Municipal Court. Other than very few instances, Many of my clients had become addicted to drugs or alcohol, had gotten into trouble, and needed help to find their way out. Many as well had mental health issues. These are the people that the Boston Municipal Court sees every day, and these are the people that I've represented for over two decades. I never saw a client as just another case. I always wanted to know about their lives, how they grew up, about their family, and what their hopes were beyond their current problem, because I wanted to know, and because it helped me do a better job for them. My clients trusted me because I trusted and respected them. I always thought when meeting someone for the first time in the lockup in Dorchester Court or in the courtroom in South Boston, that but for a lucky break or two, that could have easily been me in their shoes. I cared about my clients because so many were born into a world that really didn't care about them. They shared their lives, their hopes, and their troubles with me, and I am forever enriched. At 61, I know how life can beat you up. But every loss, and there have been plenty, opens up your heart and soul a little bit more. Doing so helps you relate, to understand, and remember that our time on Earth is brief. Our job must always be to help others. That's the kind of lawyer I've tried to be, and that's the kind of judge, if confirmed, I pledge to you to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this before the counselors have any questions for you, I know you have a few witnesses who are waiting on Zoom. Let's hear first from the Honorable Jonathan, Jonathan Kynes, Associate Justice of the Boston Municipal Court. I believe it's the uh, Dorchester Division. Good morning. Good morning. All right, members of the Governor's Council, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to appear before you again. 
Um, it's almost eight years to the day that I appeared before you in the position that Jack Garland is sitting. And I have to admit that I'm far less nervous today than I was then, but no less excited about the reason why I'm here. It is my honor and privilege to speak with you this morning about Jack Garland. In full <clears throat> disclosure, I did not know him before I was appointed to the bench back in 2013. I've gotten to know him professionally over these almost eight years, and we have not socialized outside of speaking with each other at court events or when, as I am apt to do, I try to emulate the late great Chief Justice William Tierney and remain on the bench during court recesses. I say all of that to say that my respect, admiration, and genuine excitement at the prospect of having Jack Garland as a colleague is generated primarily and almost exclusively from interacting with and observing him in court. While there are many attorneys that I like and think are terrific and nice people, there are very few that I would come before this august body, body and ask you to confirm to become one of my colleagues in the Boston Municipal Court. Jack Garland is one of those few. First, let me state the obvious, that his qualifications and experience are impeccable. <clears throat> Obviously, you've all read his application and have seen his resume, so you already know that. As a judge, when I would walk into the courtroom and take the bench, seeing Jack Garland always signaled to me that it was going to be a good day. He was consistent, always very well prepared. He knew his case, he knew the law, he knew his client, and he knew what he needed to accomplish that day, and he got it done. While doing all of that, he was always a gentleman, polite, respectful, and reasonable with everyone. Yet, when it came time to advocate for his client, he was all business. All of the things that while listening and trying to make fair and informed decisions resonated with me that this is exactly the type of person I would want for a colleague. Someone who not only knows the law and procedure, but someone who works hard, is never afraid of going the extra mile, and most importantly recognizes, appreciates, and acknowledges the humanity of every person that he interacts with. I wish I could tell you the number of times that I had a defendant in a case that either had, a had an attorney that wanted to draw, or that person was not satisfied with the attorney's representation. And when that happens, almost every attorney in the room is suddenly immensely engrossed in whatever piece of paper or electronic device is within his or her grasp. Oftentimes, the paper is upside down. And before I could even ask, Jack Garland would step up and say, Your Honor, I'll take the case. And without fail, at the next court date, that client was happy with Jack Garland's representation. I use this example simply to highlight why, in my humble opinion, an opinion that's shared with my Dorchester colleagues, Jack Garland will be a great judge. He treats people fairly, he listens, he's reasonable, and he works hard. I am truly excited and happy for the Boston Municipal Court Department at the prospect of welcoming Jack Garland to the bench. If you could counsel to see it fit to confirm him, and I wholeheartedly urge you to do. Before I close, um, I did not know this about Jack, and I just want to convey this to you, sir. Um, my mother and your mother, I'm sure, crossed paths in Finley's basement. And right now, I have a feeling that they are both watching this and catching up on old times, even though they didn't know each other. So, um, counselors, thank you again. I'm really very happy to, to be here and see some of you. I can't see all of you um, on the screen, um, but I was in front of many of you before, and it's truly a pleasure. If there are any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Judge. Before uh, we entertain any questions, we're gonna suspend this portion of the hearing. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, is going to cheer the Assembly of the Council. So at this point, we're gonna take approximately a 10 minute break. Uh, Attorney Garland, if you wanna sit there, if you wanna go over with your family, but it'll be about a 10 minute break. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor. Hey, good morning, everyone. Morning. Good to see you there. Uh, I call our assembly uh, to order. I see others participating uh, as well, in addition to the in-person members. And I ask uh, Councilor DiPaolo to lead us in prayer and pledge today. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Today, uh, I'd like us to offer our thoughts and prayers to the over 2,000 children uh, in my town, uh, Worcester, 
public school department uh, who are homeless uh, and dealing with housing insecurity uh, and that they find the strength, persistence, and community support uh, to overcome these challenges. Uh, and I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, to the Republic, which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you, Councillor. I recognize Councillor Hurley for a motion to record advice and consent for the financial warrant. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 And I recognize Councillor Ferreira for a motion to record advice and consent for the pending list of notaries, public and justices of the peace. So move, Governor. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 I recognize Councillor Devaney for a motion to record advice and consent for the appointment of Maureen Mulligan to the position of Associate Justice of the Superior Court. Second. Oh. There's a motion and a second. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I'm very pleased to make the motion for the appointment of uh, Maureen Mulligan to the Associate Justice of the Superior Court. Um, and I just wanted to add that I'm, time goes by and I voted for uh, and presided, had the honor of presiding over uh, Judge Elizabeth Behe, who she is replacing. So we've got to change that 70, we really do. But um, she, uh, I was very impressed with her background as far as, um, uh, you know, solo uh, practice and, and working in, um, in law offices with people. And every letter said the same thing, how she was so generous with her time to mentor the, the lawyers coming in. And um, she has a um, legal background that we don't see. I mean, she had to investigate lawyers who they had complaints about. She's been on the BBO. And so she brings a lot to the Superior Court that, um, that she can add that perspective. Um, I was concerned about her uh, lack of um, criminal uh, cases, and she, but she has been really, uh, really working to learn everything she can. I told her about sentencing and everything. So she's really doing her due diligence. So I'm very pleased to make the motion um, for um, Attorney Mulligan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Okay. We may begin the roll call. Councilor Tavini. Yes. Councilor Ionella. Yes. Councilor Duff. Councilor Duff. Yes. Councilor Kennedy. Yes. Councilor DePaulo. Yes. Councilor Hurley. Yes. Councilor Ferreira. Yes. Councilor Dubonville. Yes. Okay, thank you. We have a nomination today. Michael Hogan has been nominated to the position of clerk magistrate of the Lynn District Court. I believe that falls under your jurisdiction, Councillor Duff. Do you have a date and time for the hearing? Um, do, what do we have on March 3rd? We have a, I think There's we have one. A, we have one at 11, 11 o'clock. We have a James Murphy at 11. 11, that's so late. Um, are there any objections if I put this on at nine, Councillors? Does anyone need to be in court? I don't have an objection. I have, no, I have no objection. Any of the litigators, do you object to 9 a.m.? Nope. No. Okay, 9 a.m. on March 3rd then, thank you. Is that the 10th, Councillor? March that will be 3rd. on the 3rd, Wednesday, March 3rd at 9 a.m. Thank you, Governor. Okay, uh, thank you. I know you have a hearing underway. I don't wanna take you from that. I appreciate your hard work and effort. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you all. That you as well. Assembly today. Thank you. Take Thank good you. care. Stay warm. At, the, at this point, we'll resume uh, the hearing of uh, John Garland. Judge, are you with us? Judge Tynes, are you with us? I am. Thank you. Okay. At this point, do I am. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I can hear you. Yes. 
We're going to ask the uh, counselors if they have Thank any you. questions. Do any of the yeah. counselors uh, have any questions? Yeah. Councilor Kennedy. Good morning, Judge. Terry Kennedy. Good morning. I, I don't have any questions, morning, Judge. I, I, just a comment that yeah, you're doing a great job over there. I'm not over there very, very often, but when I do get there, I hear nothing but great things about uh, how you're doing in the Dorchester District Court. You're doing a fantastic job, and I just wanted to say that. And uh, I, it's, you know, pretty quick eight years that you've been on. <laughs> but from my perspective, I remember Time's hearing really well, and I, I remember uh, it was just after Christmas time, I think, that we did it, right after your mother passed. So uh, it's yeah, good to it was, see you, uh, Judge. Yeah, it was, um, keep, keep doing a great thank job. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Juvenville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to reiterate what Councilor Kennedy said. I think you're a great judge. Every time I mention your name or your name comes up, nobody has a complaint about you. So you're doing a wonderful job. And it's a pleasure when I go there and you're sitting. I know I'm going to have a fair treatment day that day. Keep up the good work. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor thank you. Devaney. Um, uh, my counselors stole my thunder, and thank you for your service. Um, I have just one small question. Can you think of one attribute of Attorney Gowan that he brings to the court? Well, I think most importantly, and I, I don't want to sound sort of um, almost contrite, but he's he's such a gentleman, and I and that that definition can be so broad and so nebulous. So I think what I'll do is is sort of sum it up in the, in the sense that there are people who can be um, people who can be angry. There are people who can be you know harsh. Um, although it can be people who can be very you know you know gentle and and uh, and not get their point across. He's he's even all the time. But when he makes a statement, when he makes a point. It's firm. You accept it. Um, you can rely on it. For example, if, if again, we're not, I consider him a friend in the sense that he's someone who I admire. And so as I get to know him more, uh, particularly on the bench, I'm looking forward to, you know, getting to know his family better. Like I said, I didn't know any of the things that he just told us about growing up in Dorchester and, you know, hearing the parallels between our families. I'm sure Wednesday night in the Garland house was the same as Wednesday night in the Tynes house. We probably had spaghetti night, you know? Um, that being said, if he told me right now that the sky was purple and that there were little green men falling out, I wouldn't go look. I'd say, well, let's look it up and see what's happening because I would believe what he said. While there are other people who if they told me that the sky was blue, I would stare at that sky for so long knowing that I can't believe what's coming out of that person's mouth. Do you know what I mean? So I don't have to worry about that with, uh, with Jack Garland. He's, He's, he's um, reliable, he's honest, he's a gentleman, and when he says something, you know he means it. So I don't know if that's one attribute of counsel. I'm sorry, I, I may have gone a little bit. I'm going to give you too many. Thank you. You can't ask better than that. Thank you so very much Thank for you. your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see you, Judge. You're doing a great job, uh, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Anna. Next, we'll, next, we'll hear from Margaret Albertson, Clerk Magistrate of the South Boston District Court. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. At this point, uh, if you'd like to make a presentation and give us your thoughts uh, about uh, Attorney uh, Garland. Thank you. Morning. Members of this honorable council, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Associate Justice Tynes, nominee Garland, members of the Garland family and distinguished guests. My name is Margaret Flaherty Albertson and I am the clerk magistrate of the South Boston Division of the Boston Municipal Court Department. I am honored to appear before you today to offer my support for the nomination of John E. Jack Garland as Associate Justice of the Boston Municipal Court Department. I'll begin with these words of Justice Thurgood Marshall. In recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. For the past 20 years, I have witnessed firsthand 
Attorney Garland <coughs> recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings in the South Boston court. From his indigent clients to the court officers, to the probation department employees, to the clerk's office staff, the judges, assistant district attorneys, and fellow members of the bar, Jack honored our humanity by treating each of us with dignity and respect. When appearing on his cases or for a duty day, he greeted everyone with a smile, a firm handshake, in those days when we could shake hands, and pleasant conversation. He was always early for the start of the session, had his cases in order, and was eager and ready to proceed when they were called. Each time Attorney Garland was appointed to represent an indigent defendant, I would observe him do the following. He would approach the individual with the designated work file already made, extend his hand in introduction, provide his business card for contact purposes, and zealously argue on their behalf. There was no appointment he was not willing to take, no assistance he was not willing to offer the court. Jack's sartorial splendor, of course, deserves note. So much so that the court employees, in addition to telling me that Jack was professional, efficient, and hardworking, all told me that he was always impeccably dressed. As a member of the Executive Board of Suffolk Lawyers for Justice and as a regular court appointed attorney assigned to the South Boston Division of the BMC Department, I have had innumerable professional conversations with Attorney Garland. Jack was one of our go to attorneys. If a duty attorney was sick or missed their duty day, or if we needed a second attorney on a co defendant case, Jack was, on our, Jack was one of the first calls we would make for help. Jack was on our short list of attorneys to call because he always responded to our requests for assistance. There was never a time that he didn't answer a call when we reached out to him. He would take on any case or indigent client without hesitation. He never refused a request by a judge to stand by a defendant when they did not qualify for a court appointed attorney to offer his good counsel on what, the dis on what a dismissal of the charges or a not responsible on a civil traffic citation meant. Whether he represented the individual pro bono as an appointed or private retained counsel, Jack gave excellent representation. He is highly regarded by the court staff and his fellow lawyers alike. In addition to having the law in common, Jack and I are both graduates of Jesuit colleges. He went to Boston College, whereas I graduated from the Superior Jesuit School in Worcester, the College of the Holy Cross. While humorous rivalry insists that our educational experiences may have been different, we both embrace the Jesuit motto of being men and women for others. Jack, in all the aforementioned and incredibly important ways for his clients, but also notably for fellow court workers. Allow me to offer one closing vignette of his goodness and humanity. In this nearly year long pandemic, Attorney Garland was the only attorney who consistently called the South Boston Court to inquire about the staff and everyone's well being. This respect for all, this willingness to honor relationships, allow the highest tribute, my summa cum laude recommendation for the nomination of John E. Garland as Associate Justice of the Boston Municipal Court Department. Thank you. Madam Clerk, it's good to see you, Terry Kennedy. Um, I can tell you that uh, your father liked the nominee a lot as well. Because he and I spent a lot of time when your father was the chair of judiciary getting his lunch <laughs> when we were pages together. And your father, yeah. was, I have to mention, he was a great guy. And uh, I know that he liked uh, the nominee. Uh, and we both liked your father a lot. I appreciate very, that, Counselor. I appreciate good that. Public servant. Jack, is, uh, Jack is hard not to like. Uh, he is well respected by, as we said, the lawyers, court personnel, and judges alike. So. Uh, excellent nomination and I support uh, support it wholeheartedly. Um, you, Madam <laughs> Clerk, thank you for coming in and giving those words and mean a lot to me. Um, I want to I want to thank you for the job you're doing for the wonderful staff you have in South Boston Court. Boy, they can't they can't do enough for people. That's uh, that's you. a feather in thank your you. cap. Um, make sure you say hi to your dad, please. I will, thank you. Any other questions? No other questions. I just want to make a comment. It's good to see you again. I remember uh, when mm -hmm. you came before us a few years ago. Uh, what a wonderful family you come from. Uh, your father, great public servant, uh, your brother, 
uh, Michael on the council is doing an outstanding job. Uh, he's, he's a great person. And uh, your words mean a lot today. Uh, so it's good to see you. And uh, thank you very much for coming by. Thank you, Council. I'm very blessed. Um, I've got a wonderful family. I've got a great staff here and um, God is good. So thank you very much. Appreciate those words. Thank you. At this point, you, uh, have uh, see if any of the councilors have any questions. We'll go to Councilor Joseph Ferrara. Thank first. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you and I spoke at length uh, the other day and um, I'm not one to prolong matters or to ask you questions just for the sake of having people hear me. Um, but uh, I spoke to uh, Sir Georges from the SJC, who said wonderful things about you. Um, Judge O'Malley from Stoughton, presiding, reached out to me, said wonderful things about you. And as a result of speaking with you, I, uh, I share their opinion. I think you're going to make a great judge and I'm voting for you next week. Thank you very much, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Hurley, do you have any questions of the nominee? Uh, actually, I spoke to you the uh, other day. Um, we had a great conversation. Um, from talking to you, I got the sense of what your witnesses said about you. Um, and uh, I think you've got a good philosophy. Uh, I think your upbringing has given you an excellent outlook on life. Uh, and um, I checked out with some of the folks I know down in that area, and uh, I intend to vote for you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Councilor Terry Kennedy. Well, uh, I don't have any questions because I've had the, uh, I've, I've known you for, I think we figured out the other day when we talked for 45 years. Right. Uh, when we worked together way back in the 70s, and we've seen each other around the courtroom multiple, multiple times. And, uh, I, I have to really write what Judge Stein said. I mean, you just do a great job when you're in there. Everybody likes you. Um, you're always well prepared. Um, home run, I'm voting for you next week, and I'm proud to vote for you. And I just Thank want you. to comment, your family should be very proud of you today because this is yeah. a great accomplishment. Thank you very much, Councilor. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from uh, Councilor Marilyn Petito Devaney. <clears throat> Morning, Good morning. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Thank you for all the time. We went over four hours. We closed the diner. So um, I appreciate that. So we worked around the weather and, and we made it. So um, congratulations on getting here. Uh, I, I think I, I'm very impressed with your uh, witnesses because they really know you. And uh, there was no hesitation for them to find the words to talk about you. And um, that means a lot to me. And in my tenure, I've had people come before me testifying, and I've asked, you know, uh, how do you know this, you know, th this um, nominee? Uh, what experience? Oh, I had one trial. I had one case. One case with him. That's that's not it. This is really great. And what's really nice is that. Um, to have um, Judge Tynes come in, you're going to be working with him. What could be better than that, you know? So I think the thing that came through to me, and I say it all the time, um, I won't vote for anyone if they don't have compassion and empathy, and you certainly have it. And I think, um, and, and you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth, that's for sure. And you don't have all your relatives on the bench, too. That's a good thing. Uh, I. Um, you know, you had a tough up upbringing, and um, and with your mother, God bless her, a single mother, what she managed to do, and for you to be a lawyer, and now you're being appointed as a judge. What came through to me, your cases, you've had some horrific cases, and um, but the thing that really impressed me was how you spend time to help other people. Uh, you know, you've been a big brother for two years for two little boys with their mother. And um, you have, um, could you tell us about the 15 years that you spent on the Suffolk Lawyer for Justice? Can you tell sure. us about that? Sure. So the Suffolk Lawyers for Justice is the organization that works with the Committee for Public Council Services. Um, we administer the program, uh, the court appointed counsel program in Suffolk County. So we um, have a role in selecting and um, offering educational opportunities. 
uh, and supervising the close to 400 attorneys that work in the Suffolk County Courts, um, both the, the, the BMC divisions um, as well as the Superior Court. Um, it's been a great opportunity. Attorneys, uh, your attorneys um, get accustomed to um, being a lawyer and representing the indigent. Um, so it's been a great experience. I've been on that board for, um, say, at least 15 years. I was actually on the predecessor board um, that was run out of the Boston Bar Association. Well, it was um, quite a journey for you to. Uh, yes. Unbelievable. November 2018, 2018. Yes. You almost made the 18 month, you did. know, limit. That was right. unbelievable. Right. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 that must be an experience waiting to hear all that time. Uh, so going on about your journey. So when you went before the judicial nominating commission, mm -hmm. and again, for people who don't know, there are 21 attorneys that have the awesome responsibility to decide in their applicants who they're going to interview who they're going to nominate, who they're going to actually uh, bring to the governor, and then the governor appoints, uh, uh, gives us the letter of nomination. Um, so 21, 21 of them, how many were there at your hearing? Uh, Council, let me think, that was a while back. I'd say there were probably 12, 13, yeah. maybe. Um, well, you hit the jackpot, that's not bad. Uh, 21 should be there, but they're not, and uh, in my beef, and, and it's nothing you can do about it, or I can't do anything about it, but you have people, sometimes there's six people there, sometimes there's eight, mm -hmm. so maybe there were 12 with you. So you've got, you've got nine, eight, or seven members of that awesome, with that awesome responsibility, who have never seen the nominee, didn't go to the hearing, didn't talk to them, didn't call them, and vote for a lifetime position. And, and that really bothers me because we don't have a lot of authority. We only have one person to vote yes or no. So um, I've been here long enough to know in the past, there was a JNC uh, chair and he told the 21 members, if you don't come to the hearing, you don't vote on the nominee. That's how it should be. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm just venting, let me. Thank you for that. Um, now, um, you've been involved in, in so many things um, outside of your uh, being an attorney, uh, serving the homeless. Um, you know, how, how did you get involved in that? And is it still going well? It is. Well, it's actually not because of the pandemic. It's been put on hold. Yeah, um, it is. It's affecting pandemic. everybody. Yeah. But I, um, I was asked to join the group by a, a fellow parishioner at St. Um, Agatha's um, Parish, where I'm a parish. It's a uh, it's a, a Quincy Milton Parish or a Milton Quincy Parish, as some people from Milton call it. Um, and we um, gather on Fridays. We collect the food. We bring it down to the Shattuck Shelter. We feed um, the homeless there. And I'll tell you, it's 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 a great experience because you don't quite understand how appreciative people are until you feed them. And what I initially thought of it as um, something I had to do turned into something I absolutely love to do and miss so much over the last year because we can't do it because it's just such a great feeling to be able to help people just <laughs> with the basic things of, of in, of in this pandemic there's so much so many more homeless so many are out of work right. and uh, it's a terrible time um, tell me what uh, you've had um, a lot of cases you're in you know you're in court two or three times a week I love right. it I love that you're, um, you're a solo practitioner. I'm mm -hmm. partial to that. Uh, I have a strong opinion that um, uh, you come with uh, more feeling uh, when you come into the court. You're responsible for shoveling the snow and paying the rent. And I, I don't know, it's my opinion. When someone comes in with a client, you're more sensitive to that client because you know they're paying a lot exactly. of money for the lawyer coming in. Right. And maybe when you're a judge, you can, I know everybody has to come in at nine, but you maybe you can arrange it. So maybe you can get them through. I just feel that, that that's what you would do. Now, um, you've had a lot of criminal cases. Um, out of all of them, 
Is there anyone that stands out? Well, two. One that you, it was so rewarding. Mm -hmm. And the other one that was your heart sick over that you lost. Are the two that come to mind? I think um, as to the one that comes to mind that was so rewarding, I represented a fellow in Dorchester Court, oh, 15, 16 years ago. He, uh, minor offenses, he was charged with minor offenses, but I got to know him. Um, the case eventually was dismissed, but I got to know him. He was probably 19 or 20 years of age at that time. He told me that he had um, uh, been raised uh, by his grandmother. His father was never in the picture. His mother, um, I think, was addicted uh, and on the streets. He had gone through seven foster homes by the time he was 19 years yeah, of age. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, And he, he, it became such an inspiration for me because he taught me what grit and determination and dignity and respect were all about. He was, he was all that and more. And I carried yeah. that case with me. And, to, um, and, to, and we talked about it. And to go through that many uh, homes, it, it must have been very hard yeah. for him. And I have a friend and um, my, my, uh, my friend's husband who was, and you know, we have wonderful people in, in foster home, that are foster parents. I don't want to say anything negative, but when he was in a foster home, um, after the family ate, whatever was left over, they would give him a set table. Those are the things mm -hmm. we don't know about that right. man. And so when you told me about how many homes, that is remarkable that he, you know, right. he, that was within, he didn't have anyone right. to inspire him to go right. on, you and know? He, and he had such a positive outlook yep. in life. It was just incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, and <sighs> the, the most disappointing. I mean, all the drug cases are disappointing because too many um, relapse and you see them back in court. Yeah. And that's, a sh that's just very difficult to, to handle. I, I actually got a call the other day um, from a woman I had helped out in, in um, South Boston court. Um, she was uh, pretty seriously addicted uh, to opioids and uh, eventually she found a treatment place in Florida and was down there for a good year and a half. Came back because of that um, dedication to her sobriety. Case was dismissed. Um, and I hadn't heard from her for about a year's time. I heard the other day and Unfortunately, she had uh, relapsed and yeah. started the battle all over again. That's but sad. relapse is just part of recovery yeah. in so many no, ways. No, I know, and I've talked about it. I have two friends, and their boys uh, died overdose of heroin. And one of them that is was from my town, Watertown, he tried so hard. He mm. really, really did. And um, I don't know why we can't get the legislat legislation to... Um, to fund uh, drug treatment centers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need them desperately. Three, I think, one for women. And, um, it, you know, um, I think the judiciary and the budget used to get like one and a half percent. I don't even know what it is now, but I think, you know, there's a big need. And, um, and I think, you know, when you think back, you know, 40 years ago, judges didn't have this drug problem that judges have yeah. to face now right. and it's i mean out of all your cases we talked about it how mm -hmm. many are drug related drug alcohol mental illness i'd say at least 90 yeah. alcoholism mental issues yeah it's um you know um and i think what i am concerned about is the pandemic mm -hmm. and i'm worried and i've said it publicly to the lieutenant governor and governor and i'm asking them to give a number he's on almost every day you could give a number for people to call. I'm concerned about child abuse mm -hmm. because the numbers are down, but we know they're not down. Right. Something's happening in those homes. And also, um, it also um, spouse abuse. And, and that's the other thing. And I am concerned because mm -hmm. if a child goes to school, the teacher will see something's wrong. Right. Or maybe that child will talk and maybe they'll see something. Babies, but we just can't do. But that's what I'm concerned about because you get people with mental issues, mm -hmm. alcohol issues, uh, drugs, and uh, just vicious people who are, I, I'm, I'm, it makes me cry every day when I read about the torturing. Just read one five-week-old baby. They beat her to death. 
I mean, it's just incredible that these are mothers, you know, we didn't grow up like that to think mothers do that, you know, but anyway, I'm getting off on it. But um, so um, it, it, tell me, you've been involved in 209 A's. I have. How do you determine if someone's being truthful? Being truthful? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, a lot of um, um, that ability is somewhat compromised because of the mask wearing and because of the Zoom hearings. Um, there's nothing like having someone in front of you and being able to, to watch the reaction, to hear their answers, um, and to be able to question them as well. Um, so until that day returns to the courthouses, um, it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be that much more difficult. Right. Well, when we talk about drugs, uh, let me ask you uh, about your philosophy. How did you vote on the marijuana question on the ballot? Um, I believe I voted. Actually, I, I can't remember. Really? Oh, well, I, I remember. But I. So you don't think it's a gateway to other drugs? There's certainly some evidence of that, and there's in in just from my own experience. Um, I had a habit of always asking clients how they got addicted. And I can remember many people telling me um, they started with marijuana. Well, and started out in, with marijuana. And you know, it's strange as time goes by. I have four children. I have two sons and two daughters. And I worried about my sons in high school mm -hmm. with marijuana. And now sons and fathers and mothers and brothers are all sitting around a table all smoking marijuana. Isn't it amazing how time goes by and it mm, changes? Huh? Sure. Now, um, tell me, um, is there any reason at all that you would ever shut off the recorder? No. Okay. It's a violation, isn't it? It is. Okay. How about... Um, do you see any distinction, someone before you, that is illegal or is a citizen? I don't see it. No, they be treated equal. Okay. Right. Well, we had one judge that told an illegal that he was um, providing for his family, big drug dealer that the police were trying to get. Hmm. And he said, if you were a citizen, I put you in jail. But you've been providing for your family, and I'm going to give you probation for two years. Well, the end of the story, and we just voted a couple of weeks ago for a judge who had that case, and it went further, and he was um, he was sent back to his country. He'd probably be back again. He was he was not supposed to come back. But that's what bothers me because I think all justice should be equal, you know. So. Um, um, it's so nice that it must be like going home to, to the Boston Municipal Court. You know the people, you're there, and, and, and you know, to have Judge Tynes come in and talk to you. Um, so um, what, what, do you, um, what do you think is the strongest uh, point that you can think of about that court, a municipal court, um, different than other courts? Neighborhood court, it welcomes all, um, and it deals with everything. It's the first stop in justice, really, for anyone using those courts. Um, I've always been impressed by the people that work there. Um, the, the dedication, especially over the last year during mm -hmm. the pandemic, which has tried everyone. Um, it's amazing how dedicated people are um, to just doing the right thing and making sure um, people are treated with dignity and respect um, mm -hmm. from the judges on down. Um, it, it, that's I been know. my And the clerk magistrates too. I, I, have, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of my tenure. Um, I have voted for everyone that came up before me because they were just um, a great caliber of people, right. I, I, I have to say. Um, so um, what, what's your opinion on minimum mandates? Minimum mandatories? Um, I, I mean, minimum mandatory, I'm sorry. Sure. Again, if I was confirmed um, and sat and heard a case, I'd want every opportunity, every option um, in terms of sentencing. And if I'm constrained in any way, um, and I recognize that obviously that's a legislative prerogative, but if I'm constrained in any way that just lessens the options that I have 
as a judge in finding the right solution um, for the case in front of me. So I wouldn't, I don't favor mandatories, uh, minimum mandatories. You know, we spent over four hours. I, I feel like you know, I know your family and I know you're very devoted to your family. And um, I think that's because um, uh, of your upbringing and, and, and you know what it is to grow up without a father. And um, I'm going to cry because I, rem <laughs> I remember the conversation that we had. So um, but, uh, I, I can't be more pleased. Um, sorry it took so long, it's all right. <laughs> but you're here now. And, and hopefully now what's happening in the municipal court? Are they able to have any um, people come into the court or is it all? Uh, um, no, um, um, given the rulings, um, uh, both from the SJC and, and Chief Justice Ronquillo, there are in-person proceedings um, that are going on in the courts right now. A lot of the proceedings, however, are still uh, via Zoom. Right. right now. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, I'm sure, and uh, the, you. So, and it was just such a pleasure to spend time with you. And uh, thank you for applying. And I want to tell you, not only you the whole package. I love your age. You know why? Because you bring life experience. But I don't think even. I mean, you. You've had life experience from the time you were a child, so I mean you're ahead of the game. But um, I'm very pleased that the governor appointed you, and um, uh, um, I'm sure you'll do great things over at the municipal court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you very much, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Duff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, good to see you, Mr. Garland. We had a good chat. Um, what do you see is other than the financial restraints that we have on courts, what do you think is the biggest challenge in the Boston courts right now? Um, Council, right now, digging out of the pandemic is the biggest challenge that the BMC and I'm sure many other ca uh, courts face. Um, I can't, uh, I, I will say um, that I probably had a good 20 to 25 cases that are ready for trial that are so called on the launching pad but can't get launched until jury trials resume and that is going to be a, a huge challenge um, digging out of that um, backlog uh, i'm sure there are several thousand cases um, that are ready for trial or even pre-trial cases that are going to go to trial that can't get there because of the necessity to continue cases well that's absolutely true i don't think anyone can argue with that what do you um so people do you think it's constitutional for us to be holding people in jails while they're awaiting trial because we can't give them a speedy trial? Um, I have a problem with that. Um, as a defense attorney, I fortunately do not have any client and held and um, held this because of the pandemic. Um, but the SJC has made rulings on that and um, we live by those rulings. Right. And how about uh, the um, the posting of bail in bonds on people who are uh, less able to pay than many are, which, uh, as we know, j disproportionately impacts people of color. Do you right. think that's fair? I don't. I don't because, um, again, having represented probably two or three thousand people, the vast majority of whom were indigent. Um, who had difficulty posting $100 uh, in bail. Um, you know, uh, the SJC ruled not, re not too recently that um, a judge has to consider the person's ability to pay. Um, other factors still weigh in the judge's decision to um, admit someone to bail. Uh, but that is a, um, a criteria that I think should be priority, um, especially nowadays if someone's being held uh, in a jail during the pandemic, even the increased risk, risk of uh, contracting um, uh, the virus, uh, that should weigh heavily on a judge's mind. Well, and I, and I appreciate what you said about the pandemic, but I think, frankly, this is a bigger uh, question and challenge that we face. I did a study on this about, I don't know, three, four years ago of the financial impact of holding uh, particularly women in uh, 
awaiting trial or because they couldn't pay their bond or bail and um, what that costs the state and, and the amounts are absolutely preposterous and huge beyond anything people realize is because if folks have children then those children have to go into the foster system um, at many times detriment to the child in their mental and physical well-being as, as well as frankly the safety in some cases but also um the cost it, it's just so out of proportion and yet the system seems really set up to punish uh people of color and particularly women so um i do ask you to be mindful of that because i don't think many of us who are born with the privilege of being white really understand how challenging that is um and I, I frankly, af, after I had the study done, I was even shocked at what the numbers were. Um, you know, I, I like to know um, financial impacts so we can have our best practices. I study this a lot. Um, you know, it's just part of, of how I'm wired and who I am. And it is one of the ways that we can make our judiciary work better. Um, so in your practice, have you represented many um, gay, lesbian people or transgender people? I have, um, both on the criminal side and on the, and on the uh, probate side. I have a divorce practice as well. And um, I actually had a probate matter um, with one of the first same-sex couples that were married in the state. So I'm more concerned uh, about folks, particularly young folks, and older folks uh, who come into the courtroom um, and maybe transgender and how they are treated. Do you have experience with that? I had one case, I remember um, right off the top of my head, um, a matter in South Boston um, of a tra transgendered person. Um, this is going back uh, probably five or six years or so ago. Um, and fortunately the case worked out fine um, and from my recollection, counselor, that person was treated with every degree of respect um, accorded anyone else in the courtroom. One would hope. Um, my concern, particularly with our youth in this um, category, is that we have a um, huge amount of kids in particularly in the pandemic it is worse than ever a gay lesbian by transgender children and i mean children i mean under 21 and frankly anyone under 25 the science proves to us that their brains aren't fully formed um but in any event these young people um are finding it for some reason safer to be on the street than to be in their homes or their foster homes which is on so many levels disturbing. Um, and because of this, we have a uh, huge resurgence in venereal diseases, particularly HIV AIDS and uh, pregnancies among young lesbians because they're working as sex workers to, to stay alive and to stay mm -hmm. warm. Um, and I, I think if you're in the district court, you really need to be aware of this. As I say many times, talking about any disenfranchised community, it never absolves you of a crime um, because you're the member of a particular community. But one, uh, as, as we are um, elected or appointed or, or given the opportunity um, to serve our fellow citizens, we need to be better. We need to rise above and we need to be of extreme um, compassion and understanding, even when it's hard for us to understand because it's a different world than so many live in. Um, and so I do ask you to be mindful of that. How about will. people um, on the spectrum? Have you dealt with any folks on the spectrum in your courts, um, in your courtroom uh, experience? Not uh, to my immediate uh, recall. Okay. Um, I know that many of the justices, the chiefs in the different courts are doing uh, really magnificent work um, educating folks around these issues. Again, it's an issue of safety for folks. It does not absolve you of committing a crime. There are, there are many um, 
people who who have challenges who do commit crimes you're still guilty but how you were treated and um and how you in you in your safety not just in the courtroom but frankly if you're sentenced to to jail or to prison um is of the utmost importance to me so i do ask you to be aware of that i also would like to take this opportunity to say not just to you but frankly to the public or to anyone that's watching today um, and to all the chiefs of our different courts, our different divisions of the courts, they're doing an extraordinary job right now uh, during this pandemic. Uh, the chiefs of the trial courts, of the appeals court, of the superior court, of the uh, judicial court. Um, it is a challenging, challenging job, and it's a challenging uh, business to be in and managing. And as you stated so eloquently, um, Attorney Garland, it, the pandemic has just uh, compounded the challenges more and more in ways we never could have anticipated. So I do want to say um, my great gratitude and thanks to the judges and to the chiefs who are really going above and beyond and doing their very best, because I don't think enough a praise in good is given to them, particularly in times like this. Um, it's very easy to criticize a judge when you don't agree with their ruling or frankly understand it. Um, how judges get to their ruling sometimes is is not something that, that I may have gone through that process. And as Counselor Devaney often refers to uh, Judge Feely's ruling, <laughs> And but but no one ever talks about why he came to that ruling. And it's a in it constitutionally, it is a fascinating uh, piece of constitutional law of how he got there. It's also fascinating because he's a he was well, he sat a very, very conservative judge. So um, I think we need to, to give great uh, respect to these folks because I think most of them, if not all, are doing an extraordinary job and extraordinary work right now in times of trouble like we have never seen. And we will continue to be challenged by for years to come from the backup. As you yourself said, you, you may have six jury trials backed up. You're one fella, right? So all the other men and women that are waiting for jury trials, it's just compounded in the, the challenges are tremendous. So I'm not trying to trick you with these any of these questions, but I want to jog your brain so that if you ascend to the bench, which I sus suspect you will, that you are always thinking um, of these things in, in that you are very... Um, you know, your brain is, is is always moving with this. And and I suspect also, Attorney Garland, and uh, forgive me because I'm just babbling on right now, but I, I suspect from your background um, that you are a person who, um, and especially after speaking with you for quite a while, that um, is curious. And curiosity is something that helps us to learn in listening is something that really listening, not really hearing people, uh, helps us to learn and to grow and to get out of our own comfort zones so we can be better public servants. Um, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna throw this a little bit differently. Do you have any questions you wanna ask of me or of the council since I'm asking you right now? I've never done that before, but um, what is going through your mind during this process? No, I, I don't have any questions that I could uh, that I could ask publicly of you right <laughs> now. Any other, well done. Any other counselors? Well done. All right, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you, um, Attorney Garland, for your application and for your your willingness to step up and serve the Commonwealth. It is very much appreciated. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Counselor Robert Juvenville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have much for you. I, I see that you were an aide to Brian Donnelly. I was. Back Did in you the work year. down in the Washington office? No, I worked in the Boston office, the JFK building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah have right. you seen Brian at all lately? I haven't. Unfortunately, I yeah, haven't. I, mean, no, I heard he's old. down the Cape. Right. He yeah. lives down at Dennis. Yeah, yeah. he's a great guy. He's Super. Great guy. One of the best. Yeah, I, I think you were a wonderful nomination. Thank uh, you. You can't ask for much more than what you have in your background. And, your kindness to people. So 
uh, I don't I don't have any issues. I'm going to vote for you next week. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor uh, DePaulo. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, and thanks for being here, and thanks for talking with me earlier. And um, uh, all the issues I care about have been talked about, but I do just have a couple questions. We heard about um, whether it's uh, poverty or winding up in the foster system. Uh, Councilor Duff talked about LGBTQ youth, um, and then uh, and then along racial lines, we see black and brown kids end up in the juvenile system, and often these kids graduate, unfortunately, into into district court. Um, so what I'm wondering is, uh, A, uh, how you contextualize those things in your dis in exercising your discretion as a judge, uh, which I think you've spoken to, but also um, what your understanding uh, and approach uh, to addressing implicit biases uh, were you to take the bench? Uh, if I could take the first, uh, the second question first. Yeah. Um, so I've read the Gantt study. Um, and I think it's very instructive to um, not just judges, but everyone that works in the court system um, to have an opportunity to read that and to understand that and to understand where um, that subtle bias comes in. Um, we're not talking about uh, flagrant abuses and, and flagrant uh, uh, offenses and offensive talk and offensive um, implications, um, but the subtleness and you know, training, um, the more experience you have, I think, in understanding how that comes into the process, into the system, um, the better you are um, to deal with it. Uh, the more aware you are of it, uh, the better you are to deal with it. Um, I heard from lots and lots and lots of clients um, that I had in the Boston Municipal Court, particularly in the, in the Dorchester Division, um, of, of countless, I can't tell you how many um, stories of um, people who were the victims of that bias and how that affected them and how that affected their cases and how that affected how they felt about the system. And um, as I said, I heard that hundreds of times. And believe me, those stories stay with me. And something as simple as uh, being a student in a school where the school resource officers uh, have a practice of arresting students uh, as opposed to a child in a in a different district uh, can can get the kids in the system and, exactly and uh, uh, and it's important to contextualize the backgrounds and and the right. records that you see right um, the thing that was most impressive to me about talking with you is your handle uh, your compassion your pragmatism towards mental health and addiction um, what's your impression of the mental health uh, access and treatment uh, in our Department of Corrections right now uh, limited at best. Um, I deal more with my clients that were, were more sentenced to, well, held, held in jail, um, uh, supervised by the sheriffs, or in the houses of correction. So I didn't deal as much with the Department of Corrections itself. But in just in that context, um, services are limited. Staff is limited. Um, caseworker dedication um, is sometimes a catch as a catch can. Um, some of my clients lucked out because they had a caseworker that was um, caring and aggressive and wanted to help them get the treatment they needed while they were being held or while uh, they, they had been sentenced. Um, so unfortunately, it's, it's not the best it can be. It certainly needs a lot of work. Uh, and my last question then relative to that. So how would you describe the balance of your discretion were you to take the bench between rehabilitation uh, deterrence and then punishment. How do we how do we balance that scale? So again, every case is, is its own case. I mean, every decision that I make obviously would be based on the facts of that particular case. Uh, but I think jail is always a last resort. You try to do everything you can to keep people out of jail. Those that need to be kept out of jail. Those that are truly suffering from an addiction or mental illness. And again, my experience my practice was that the vast majority of cases with those types of people that had suffering that were suffering from some kind of a substance abuse disorder or some mental illness um so locking those people up i think i think everyone's over that no one's no one's thinking about doing those kind of things anymore uh, so 
again, having been, I think, sensitized to those issues, uh, my discretion would weigh heavily, heavily in um, making sure those people get treatment um, as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. I definitely appreciate your perspective on that, uh, and I uh, absolutely look forward to supporting. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Thank you. I'm looking at your uh, resume. Candidate Boston City Council, 1983. Yes. See how good my memory is. Probably not that that good. Was that Jim Byrne? That, in the final, it was Jim Byrne and me. Right. No, that was pretty good on my part. That was a long time Very ago. Very good. Well, as you know, my father served sure. on the council until right. he passed away in 1992. Right. Uh, I don't have any questions. Uh, we had a lengthy conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're going to be a great addition to the court. You have the right demeanor, the experience, the temperament, which is so important. And uh, when your name comes before us next week, uh, I'll be more than happy to put your name forward. Thank you very much. Best Council. of luck. Thank you. That will conclude the hearing. We will take up uh, Mr. Garland's nomination next Wednesday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Oh,